Welcome and good evening everyone, uh, live and remote. My name is Lukas Feierreis. This is the fourth session of the Studium Generalis Juxtaposition Public Lecture Series here at the Berlin University of the Arts on the topic of contemporary cultural production. A lecture series that aims to provoke and inspire a broad cross-disciplinary audience within and beyond the school. A lecture series in which an eclectic group of international artists, architects, designers, curators and writers have been asked to share their work and world with us. The common denominator here is that all of them refuse disciplinary coherence. They all work outside given norms and forms and have established a practice beyond standard protocol. Or with the words of science fiction author, aeronautical engineer and naval officer Robert R. Heinlein, and I'm especially grateful to, for Florian Hadler for, uh, for this quote, specialization is for insects. Um, that said, I'm very thrilled uh, today to have curator, writer and designer Matilda Krzykowski here <laughs> with us tonight. Uh, Matilda and I met uh, a few years ago, and I think when you just moved to Berlin, um, Matilda was teaching in Chicago at the School of Arts Institute um, and we ran into each other at a, at a social event and I was immediately taken by her like seemingly unstoppable energy and uh, restless curiosity and proactive approach um, towards everything and everyone uh, in the city and, and beyond. Matilda um, is in a way a fellow curator, a fellow hybrid. She um, plans, designs, writes and talks about physical and digital space. Um, her work is uh, inherently transdisciplinary, very hard to pinpoint and it focuses on developing cultural and commercial formats that range from exhibitions, installation and exhibits to choreography, performance and video to name a few. Um, Matilda, you have a very long CV of projects and positions that uh, you did and that you held. You're currently um, the space and web curator of Civic, a newly established exhibition and discourse platform at the Academy of Art and Design in Basel. You're the co-curator of institution building at CIVA, C-I-V-A in Basel. Um, you initiated, scripted, curated and moderated Airtime, a TV show about contemporary Swiss design and many more today. We, we are basically invited to one of your desktop exhibitions. Um, uh, thank you very much for being here and welcome Matilda. Thank you, Lucas. I also must say that, uh, yes, we met a few years ago, but I think you're the person who has invited me most to all your lectures and also all your cultural projects that you've done so far, which I'm very grateful for. So, as um, Lucas already mentioned, I have a very, very hybrid uh, practice and I'm here to tell you a little bit about it and how I deal with it because very early on I realized, yes, maybe I have an artistic practice, but I will never have a studio practice and I have never longed for it because I do really love to go to institutions or clients and all sorts of clients and I work with their kind of uh, spatial configurations, but also the configurations that they established. And I want to respond to things. It's not that I always come up with everything by myself. It's more that I really like to go to places, analyze them and give a certain response. And you are all going to have Nicolas Bourdieu here in a few weeks. And he wrote this fantastic book, Relational Aesthetics, which I've learned by reading out of it so much about how you cultural production is not always something that you, you, that you, it's coming from you, it's more something that is defined by a response and you analyzing the given. But as I said, I don't have really a studio uh, practice, I do have an apartment in Berlin that, uh, and I pay my taxes in Berlin actually, but I do work every week in another country, in another city, obviously in the last two, two years a little bit less on the road. Um, mm. So somehow I kind of created or thought of my desktop as my studio space in a way. So what you see here is actually my desktop background, which stems a little bit from an idea that I was impressed by. It's as an historical example, which is Duchamp's Bois and Balise. It's called Box in a Suitcase. And what Duchamp did, he would 
in order to have all his miniatures, all his work with him all the time. And you know how it is. It doesn't matter if you do sculpture or if you do your video programmer or whatever you do. It's always the heaviness of owning something and archiving it, shipping it, that maybe keeps on, like limits you in your flexibility. But what Lusson did is he designed this, um, and again, an artist who made a design decision, he uh, came up with his pot de, uh, de balise, and uh, with this idea that wherever he would go, he had this miniature version of his own work with him. So me, myself, as in my practice, I feel like that I take my what and valise, which is my laptop, everywhere, and I can go into this really long, extended Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole where I kind of pull out all the information that I need every day, uh, or, let, worst case scenario, I open the internet. So obviously you wonder, how do you start a practice like that, you know? And uh, while I was studying, and I did uh, first graphic design in Germany as an apprenticeship, and then I did uh, um, product design studies in an art academy in the Netherlands. And I felt I need some sort of kind of release. And what we have today as Instagram, we used to have 15 years ago <laughs> as a blog, you know. And I called it Mad and Me because it was initially a blog that I wanted to share with my brother as a platform, calling like Mad and Me, like Matthias and Matilda, that's my brother's name. He's actually, it's still online and he's still paying for it because it was a birthday gift. So you know what it means. And he said, I'm going to have it until I die. So let's see. But what I did is I used my uh, curiosity that, that Lucas just underlined by photographing, writing about things that I was interested in. And I posted these things with you know, pictures and a little bit accompanying text. And I created some sort of my, my personal own archive that I can always still go back to. Because I think I've started, I don't know, 2000 nine or something like, no, 2007 I started. And what I did also, I developed something that is called Drawn Interviews, which was the door opener for me to a lot of studio spaces and to a lot of practitioners. Meaning that I send an email and saying, hi, I'm Matilda from Ed and Me. This is my platform and I'm coming with these three pieces of paper. And then I ask these practitioners to answer three questions. Draw yourself, draw your favorite object, and uh, describe yourself in one word. And one great example, for example, is Murray Mas, who used to be a gallerist in New York. He's, he still is alive, of course, but he has stopped his, his gallery. And he drew as his favorite object. He drew a nail in a, in a thread. And I said to him, why? And he said, well, Matilda, I have Parkinson's. And an object, there, there's, a, there's instinctive kind of connotation to an object. But the objects that are challenging for us are the ones that you actually become the biggest burden, but they are the most kind of powerful object as such. So it's still, as I said, still online, and it's kind of started a little bit my practice. And it started also this kind of extreme notion and, and longing for, as a, if I want to come up with these different types of formats that I, that I want to develop, where I bring people and ideas and, and intentions together, and I respond to them, how does this space can look like? And I very randomly, when I did an improvised exhibition and, um, in, in, in Milan, I met a group of Swiss people, uh, Laura Precker and Moritz Walter, and they, were, they used to be a couple. And they said, oh, Matilda, you have to come to Basel because maybe we have to next to talking about architecture so strongly in, in, in the city of Basel and next to talking about art so strongly, we need to talk about design more, but not as a just commercial entity, but more the social implication that design actually has, given the fact that everything around is really designed. So we sat down and initially we really, really wanted to just make one exhibition. But once we sat down, we realized, wow, you are an economist, you have a knowledge and the fundamentals for launching something with us. And the other person was strategically very good and was a good project manager. I had a vision of artistic direction, but it, it was not the singular ideas, it was the conversations that we had that really brought us in founding Depo Basel, which was an 850 square meter silo. And from the beginning, because you know, normally you write a manifesto after you've worked for a really long time, you know, and then you have actually something to say after 10 years. But in this case, we knew that we have to call it, we are not a fair, nor a festival, not a museum, a showroom or a gallery. We are a temporary place for contemporary design with only the best intentions, because we knew that the press would do otherwise. So a little tip, which I always do when I do my projects, before someone can name you something, you think about the language that you want to use in order to prevent the fact that they will call you something that you don't want to be. 
So this is like this, how the space looked like a little bit. It was, as I said, a massive 850 square silo where we did really from architectural experiments to uh, screenings about the conditions of, of architecture in, uh, in China, but also how what choreography means for design and the other way around. We did a lot of commissions, and that's how I learned how with a really small budget and the format of an exhibition or a format that extends an exhibition, you can really bring a lot of practitioners together. And we, of course, we work with graphic designers here, in this case with Deutsche Nampana, to create some sort of identity. In between, we moved even, you know, like from this 850 square, square meter silo, we wanted, we decided that we want to install, instead of expanding, we wanted to concentrate ourselves again. So we moved in a 120, 120 square meter space. And I really loved that when someone, someone came up and came with, you know, with a, with a tagline, revolt on the side, which obviously was not from us, but it was nice that, that the, the outside also kind of realized that what we do is, is a little bit expanding kind of the connotations of an exhibition space. But we also, what we did is, while we were programming for about eight years, we realized that there's a lot of waste happening. For example, scenography. Every time when you make an exhibition, you have to design it from scratch. And we wanted to make, create some sort of identity, so we created this scenography system that is basically based on the parameters of the windows in the existing space. And it, it's basically frames that are welded uh, by Moritz, um, Moritz Lena. Moritz Lena is the son of uh, the founder of <sighs> Zitterwerk, Zitterwerk in St. Gallen. And um, it's an idea where you use frames horizontally and vertically together with a clamp that we also designed out together. So you have the flexibility of showing and it's out of metal, me meaning it also has a magnetic feature. So you have really all the different kind of uh, pragmatic, uh, you have the possibility of hanging in, in different kind of uh, frameworks. And we did a lot of experiments, exhibitional experiments. For example, this is uh, a place dinner where Sibyl Stöckli, she did a Kickstarter campaign, huge Kickstarter campaign. She got a really a lot of money and she traveled for six months for the world. And then we gave her our space for one month. We didn't have opening times because when you think about it, why, does it, why is a museum and a gallery open from 10 until 7 when the majority of people have to go to work? So it's almost like culture is only exclusive for a certain certain people that have access to it because they don't have to work, which is obviously excluding everyone else. And so we decided that we want to also question these parameters of an exhibition space or a cultural space. And what, what Sibyl did, she, she was only open every day for lunch. So you bought into a lunch and while uh, she was cooking for you, so it was almost like a two hour presentation, she would tell you about all the objects that she's covered over the years uh, over, sorry, over the period of his months of her travel, but so she created kind of a narrative that was again responsive, not just underlining something from the script, from from the beginning, but just about the ability of of telling stories. Or this one, for example, where that was called uh, super um, super stu no, no, it was a super stu super. I even forgot the title. It doesn't matter. But the par the the format was a little bit different than a normal exhibition, because what frustrates me as a curator always is that you come up with an exhibition, you set up all the objects, people walk in, they see their friend, they walk to the friend, and then everything is lost. The narration of the, of the, of the object also, I like dramaturgy. You want to show what you, we want to, you want specifically show one object and then that other object respond to the other, instead of someone trying to make sense of it by themselves. So what we did is, it was a performance. So people had to walk in into the space, sit down, and the light was switched on, and the light was switched on. I came on, I was a little bit like a circus dumpter, you know, like came in and said, welcome everyone to the super show. And then I told them first about the other object, and then the second, and then I had a second person in this uh, show that referred to another object. So it was a little bit like a ping pong, where physically a few people that are co-curators are always pointing at another object, so it become, became more a performance than an exhibition itself. So, moving forward, we have only we have realized that during that time we were not only in, like the interest that came also from a lot of existing institutions all all over the world that thought that our formats are some sort of ground groundbreaking. So, one thing that I want to show you here 
is design date. Should be audio. Yeah. Can you hear me when I speak? You know Herzblatt, which is a German TV show, where three people on one side are sitting here and one person selects the person to go on a date with. And in my theory, professionally speaking, we always look for another partner. We look for a professional partner in order to pursue our ideas and I work on it uh, on the day things that we want to do professionally. So what we did is basically, is when the Victorian Albert Museum in London came to us and said, hey, we want you to do a lecture series, I suggested that we shouldn't do a lecture series, we should do something that is informative, entertaining and playful and also a format that everyone knows. So what we did is we put on the, on the other side, on one side, three designers, on the other side, um, the, uh, and behind the paravan, there was Jana Scholze, who used to be the head of the design and uh, architecture department of the VNA, and she asked three questions because she was looking for designers that she would be finding interesting in order to present in the exhibition that she was working on about luxury, and it worked. But of course, we didn't give these people. I don't know, a flight to the Bahamas or a romantic candlelight dinner, we gave them a 50 pound voucher for business conversation. And it's interesting because we as contemporary in entity being running this space for seven years, we, we grew such a network. So for us it was really interesting to use our skills in order to bring people in public together and show also the mechanism of, you know, like, I don't know, to this kind of flirtatious things that you do when you want, when you actually really want the job, or um, and at the, at the end, it's a little bit like it's the mechanism that we have in private, but we have in professional life. But we really display them in that kind of sense. And I have to say, after we did it once at the VNA, I did it at Zoho House in Istanbul. I did it at all kinds of occasions, and it's always interesting how people like to pursue or see that kind of kind of very like because it's 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 almost like live theatre, because you not, not fully can plan what actually is going to happen and how smart someone is in their answers or not. So let me move forward. Um, after running it for about seven years, we had to at some point uh, decide that we stop because the energy was still there technically. We even obtained a lot of funding, but we knew that it's time to, for us to move on also maybe in separate ways. So what we did is we developed a website that we called Online Depot. Front end design. We pursue own projects, projects and offer services, local, local and global. global. Online, Online Depot, Depot presents, presents the ever-growing practical, practical and theoretical knowledge we generate with our contributors. Uh, during that time when we were running Depo Basel, we won a few uh, different types of cultural or, or design related prizes, but the last prize that we won was actually really for the development of this online depot, because we wanted to build an online archive, because we knew that at some point when you start working, there's always a certain reference, and again, what I said before, storing things, you know, like I do really know a lot of practitioners who stop working because they don't have they don't want to feel the heaviness of, of objects that to, to maintain them and also what a museum does, you know, like maintaining them, um, conserving them and also yeah, like keeping them for the future as a reference for, for the world. But what we did is we wanted to create a website that leaks, looks like when you walk on it, like when you open it, that it's not, it's not outdated because, you know, when you play with dates, in the moment that you, when you have 2007 there, you just almost think like it's, it's not worth it to look at it because it's something old. But we re really created something that, uh, that looks a little bit like everlasting and something that also works with A, the formats that we worked, focusing on the formats, and then uh, the current contributors because we've, I think we listed all the people we work with and they were about 800, partly students and partly singular people and obviously the contact uh, website. And that's how we actually basically stopped in 2018. And after really like notoriously moving objects and things and creating kind of, you know, like a reality for other people in space, I actually invented in that moment this desktop exhibition, which actually usually uh, looks a little bit different because usually you ask when I do a lecture that I sit 
in the picture. So sitting in the picture means that in proportion, it looks like the shelf exists in space, like in physical space, because the proportion looked like it could be like ne next to me. And then you create this kind of illusion between the digital and physical that has always worked very well. But in this case, of course, uh, there's limitations to the spaces that you present. But I mean, I don't only use it as in my own personal desktop where I show like and put into these shelves all these folders and exhibits and references that I want to show and to create a narrative. But I also really create exhibitions in it. So for example, this was my first desk exhibition that I did for Chus Martinez at the Institut Kunst in Basel. Uh, she did a symposium that was called Is Gender uh, Sexist? And I knew, didn't knew necessarily in the beginning if I have to say something about that topic, but I guess you know, Lucas, how it is. You get a request of someone and you think, hmm, is it interesting enough for me to pursue that theme? And I always realize, I like to think about making a non-exhibit, but I actually prefer to look at existing work and try to make make sense of it in, in, a con in a context that I find suitable to be told. So in this case, I asked Tom Hancocks, a New York-based uh, uh, artist, to do the stenography, which basically means with the desktop background. Uh, I told him about some of the exhibits that I have in mind, and I also commissioned some of the exhibits. So for example, here you have Tamar Shafir talking about the male and female theory voice, or you have, um, I don't know, artificial womb, a text by next nature. And what I like about it is normally I would have to take you all into a space, in a physical space, and we would put, put all the things around in a space. You probably won't hear me fully. It will be too loud and maybe you will be less concentrated. But somehow I feel you looking, I walk you through this exhibition through your eyes. Why, by you following me, how I click. And it's a little bit like puppet theater in a way. It's, it has its own, its own limitations, but it has a playfulness that I personally really, really enjoy. So let's move forward to um, something else that I did about one or two years after, which is, you all know, for example, Richard Hamilton's Just What Is It That Makes Homes Today So Beautiful and So Appealing. I actually have a picture of that as well. So it's this extremely famous uh, collage that was done in the 50s, 60s in, 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 uh, in England by Richard Hamilton while he was invited to a show that is called This Is Tomorrow at the White Chapel Gallery. And what he did is he collaged all these things that he found uh, very appealing back then into one picture and that made, became one of the most famous pictures that actually started pop art. So people say art historically that po this picture is the, the reason why we call the, like the, the era pop art because he is actually the bodybuilder uh, holding a lollipop in their hand which says pop and it's, it, it used to be, or it's still a brand that exists in the US, it's Tootsie, uh, Tootsie Pop. Uh, so it's basically a lollipop. And I always ask myself, 60, 70 years after this collage, we still look at this collage and think about what it meant 70 years ago. And what does it mean when I do a series of exhibitions that will be obviously exhibitions in physical space, but next to that, I will commission four, because I did four exhibitions for this gallery in New York, and I ask then four different artists to put all these objects into a digital collage that was animated also partly because Hamilton 70 years ago didn't have the technical uh, possibilities to animate something. But these different practitioners from um, Builders Club to Coase Brain or Sasha Stuchin, who eat by each theme actually thought about how these objects could kind of create a narrative uh, within a file that can be distributed much easier than all the objects actually. Hashtag shipping costs. <laughs> um, I'm going to move forward to something that I did uh, one and a half years ago. It's, it's Total Space. It's an exhibition at the Museum für Gestaltung in Zurich. Uh, they have a new contemporary um, curator and it was his first actually big show and he just said, let's do something, Matilda, that it's completely unexpected. Because he knows that I always try to make exhibition that kind of uh, I'd question or kind of diminish the whole kind of idea of a white cube exhibition. 
So we called it Total Space because on that day, Wim Kral is a diet. Wim Kral is a graphic designer who coined the term, um, I cannot think of it, total, not total space, but total design. Um, it was the most first, most hybrid uh, design agency. And in that phone call that we had with Sasha Stuchin from Soft Baroque, she said that we're not interested anymore in designing singular objects. We are only design, interested in designing total, like environments, total environments. And this kind of triggered me and I thought that the term total space is something that, that is maybe, maybe a term that we can use and appropriate in this connection of speaking about um, design exhibitions. So I talk you through a little bit. Oh, wait. So what we did is basically we really kind of connected the digital and physical space by, for example, that was something that I really had to fight for, but at the end, Dana was really convinced that it's a great idea, that we will have a Wikipedia article, which is a walkable, a walk-in Wikipedia article. Because you know how it is, you create a curatorial text and then the parameters of the text are quite uh, cryptic sometimes. Even the language is cryptic. It also goes back to inclusion, you know, or or exclusion, basically. Uh, so what we did is we did the, we designed this kind of huge roundabout, and then we really created this kind of structure that is in a just generic uh, Wikipedia article and put it in a space. But in a way that when you would stand in the middle of this kind of platform, that you could read still the text. I mean, of course, some people probably need glasses for it, but you were still like physically able to turn around and completely see the text and 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 almost, almost physically experience the. Uh, the text of, um, of the exhibition. This is the book that we also have a, like a, a section where we put a lot of books around. So I also took uh, Lucas's Space is the Place that also very, very beautifully refers to total space. We had a lot of contributors. And what I also really realized, I like to think about how we can implement screens much stronger because screens is the thing that we actually, are, especially in the last one and a half to two years, are trained so much to view. So what we did is uh, we, we asked a lot of contributors to talk about their own total spaces of uh, uh, total spaces that already exist or how they think of what the total, total space means. And we used this huge screens and I have to say it's about two meters tall screens and they were flipping like you would scroll for Instagram. So we used a lot of methodologies that we got used to it uh, and we created almost like installations within space that use different types of screens. But we also f did Zoom calls, because you know how it is. You have so many interesting conversations with your practitioners, but they're disclosed, you know? Sometimes there is an interview of it. But we really uh, bluntly uh, filmed, or like just with a quick, uh, quick screen grab, we filmed the conversation we had with everyone about the own total spaces, and we just edited them down and put them into the exhibition space. And we got a lot of good feedback because people would re really, always really like to see the process of an exhibition and how it turns out and what the conversation is about. So just to give you an overview, it was a, a 850 square meter space that really started from one space to the other and overlapped and was dense. And it's almost like someone said, you walk in and you forgot that you're in a museum. You're some, in such an alternative, space that somehow plays with the digital and physical. And um, as, as Lucas already explained, I curate, but every time when I curate, I make design decisions. I develop the furniture, I, I think about how, how physically the visitor is in the space while, while he or she is looking at something, which is very important to me. So it's also we create a lot of loopholes and a lot of feedback spaces for the exhibition, uh, um, ex exhibition viewers. But we also, programmed um, a video that I will show you quickly. Because I always ask myself, because I also really love working with video, like in an eight month exhibition when the curator is not there, you just have the curatorial text and the exhibits that speak for themselves, but the person that actually is responsible for it is not present. So what uh, Damien and I did is this video that we can show in the beginning maybe, yeah, with some please. Serenity. Bist du entspannt? Ich könnte entspannter sein. Ich könnte auch entspannter sein, aber es ging ja schon hin. Ich hätte mir echt einen Schnaps trinken sollen. Total Space ist immersiv. 
Willst du mir nicht erst sagen, dass es das Manifest ist? Nein, wir fangen gleich, fang gleich an. Okay, dann fang du an. Total, Total Space, Space ist immersiv. Total Space ist transdisziplinär. Total Space ist analog und digital. Total Space ist visuell und auditiv. Total Space ist Gesamtraumerfahrung. Total Space ist Fantasie. Was ist Total Space? You can, uh, you, uh, all my videos and everything I've done in, in the context of his work is on my Vimeo account and I'm happy for you if you want to uh, delve into it. But it was interesting for us next to all these kind of different kind of uh, existing uh, questioned formats, screens, we really decided to make this video that was a 10 minute video and you could obviously read it if you wanted or listen to it or just see the picture. But it was really helpful for people to understand, especially when you try to kind of bend the, the existing rules of exhibition making, that you kind of give almost this gesture like someone is here for you to explain. And it's, and it's something that actually right now I've continued to work uh, in, in my following exhibition project that I did, which is called Airtime. And I show this video before I explain what it is about. Audio? For all these desires, what is wanted? For all these desires, excellent question as always, Mr. to explain also who that person was that said that was there in the beginning. I mean, you, the, the crazy thing is like when you when I think about how I started in 2007 with this blog, uh, working with such a high amount of people, I and always thinking about another format. And I mean, the term is mediation, you know, like in German, you say Vermittlung. How do you ma mediate certain ideas to a, to a broad uh, public? How does format stick? How does language stick? How does uh, certain things that, that have influenced to kind of uh, reach a different audience. And I'm not talking about only your peer group. I'm really talking about all, you know, all, all, um, all kind of, yeah, a big, big audience, basically. And in this case, it was kind of funny because they actually asked me to do an online exhibition. But during COVID, one and a half years of clicking and re the reproduction of, you know, existing physical things onto a white wall in online space where you just scroll in and scroll out was a bit underwhelming for all of us. But what I realized is what people like is, they like if you, if you tell them a story and you, they know that they heard the whole story. It's the same like you make an exhibition and you do have to think about the dramaturgy. Theater is amazing because it plays with dramaturgy from the, from the beginning and to the end. And you just know there's these highs and lows where you, where, where, where you, where you I don't know, where you maybe physically overwhelmed, but also mentally overwhelmed. And I think that's the best outcome, outcome that you have. So what I did in this case of this exhibition, and I'll show you also uh, maybe quickly on the website, is like the Swiss consulate came to me, the Swiss Design Awards together with an entity that's called Wanted Design. And Wanted Design is quite a commercial entity in New York that basically displays beautiful um, uh, charming, but very kind of commercial objects, things that you can buy and you enhance your personal environment. And, not, and I'm all interested in all spheres of design, but I'm mostly interested what design could do possibly. And also, I, I don't know, I thought that when an entity like that does call themselves wanted design, it's funny that they never actually used what is wanted as, as a claim, you know? I, I, seemed to be almost obvious for me. So what I did is I did something that I actually always do and even, even did it more extreme because when I choose my project, I have a rule. It's a rule that I established together with Vera Sacchetti, who is a friend of mine who runs with me Foreign Legion, which I very, Foreign, Foreign Legion Global, will show you very quickly. 
It's something that I run with uh, Veda Sakati together because sometimes uh, Vera and I work uh, in order to give space to uh, people who are overlooked in history, which is usually uh, not the cis white man. Um, so what we do, we do different type of projects uh, that either manifest themselves in exhibitions or in, or in publications or in exhibits. For example, we did a poster for the architectural pavilion, the pavilion, German pavilion uh, of architecture this year that basically placed in 2038 in the future. And the poster only says one thing, what took you so long? Because we sometimes still wonder, what took you so long? So we thought it needs a poster for everyone to think about that, what took you so long? Especially when it comes to gatekeepers that open and close doors for other people. So what Darren and I always do is, we have this rule, work always in each project with 50% of people that you don't know and 50% of people that you've never worked before. And that way you can expand the canon. Because for me it's all really shocking when I sometimes open a program of a museum and I just think, okay, nepotism galore, you know? It just, it's, it's just clear who is inviting who for what kind of reasons in order kind of to be profitable in a kind of way. So here I w found 14 practitioners that I've never worked before in my life, which in this case is uh, Reeves is run by Marie. She's an artist, but she was fed up by the art market and she had a really great idea because she is a scuba driver. Uh, and she developed um, a whole system how to 3D print coral reefs for areas in the world where the coral reefs basically are getting distinct. And she now has a company with two uh, scientists and one, uh, one business person and the company is called Reefs. So when I asked Marie, what do you want or what is wanted? She says, saving the endangered biodiversity of ecosystems, living organisms and non-living components. Or, wait, jumped over. Or Bamna Dadashade, I, had, I love that name, Bamna Dadashade, isn't that beautiful? Uh, who works uh, as a theorist, but actually is an industrial designer. And what she does is she's analyzing AI and how AIs are like designed to be stereotypical uh, and she wants to break that. So she said for her, what is wanted, courageous yet responsible methodologies to create futures today. So I have this kind of different people who work with different kind of expanded ideas of what design is, which is here working with mycelium and how um, it's a living material. So why can't, why couldn't be the design environment also something that rather responds than um, may just be designed and, and uh, it's always awkward. Every, everyone, when someone says it's like 10 minutes, you just always get, already get nervous and think like, okay, now I have to rush. Or uh, Paula Cermone Leon, who is Peruvian, but she's trained as an industrial designer in Switzerland because my client was Swiss. But I always say, what does this mean even, you know? I mean, I, like when you've been trained in a school in the Netherlands for 10 years of your life and maybe you were you're co connect, like, connotated to be looking Asian, but maybe you are not even because you're second generation. So we also really have to maybe kind of question kind of the stigma of nationality, but really kind of expand or like, t like withdraw from that. And here, Paola, for example, uh, is looking very much into um, edibles, but the edibles and plants and extracts that you have around and how you can actually uh, produce the, you know, like, I don't know, like a r relief for your skin or uh, aspirin to calm you down, but only for natural kind of things, but also designs the aesthetics out of it. So the whole video and the whole production is actually 32 minutes long, but, the, but unfortunately it's not online at the moment, but I'm really hoping that there will be a possibility to screen it a few times uh, afterwards. So I'm going to move over to my last project that I want to uh, share with you, which is uh, an exhibition that I just did at the Architecture Museum in uh, Brussels, together with Nicolas Hirsch and um, Cedric Liber. Uh, what is very unusual with this exhibition is because it's an exhibition that started with a few exhibits in the space and con continued to expand through, the, through, through, through 10 weeks. So usually you plan an exhibition where it's ready and then for 10 weeks you try to kind of come up with different kind of public programming in the sense that you kind of try to keep the exhibition and the themes around it and the exhibits alive. But here we did it completely the other way around, which I will show you here. So this is the uh, exhibition space in, in, the, in the Institute. 
Uh, we started with this super empty space. You can actually see Nic Nicolas here standing there with Anne Fontaine and Frick Perrin from, uh, from an architecture studio in, in um, Brussels. Uh, you see these white lines. Every chapter of this exhibition, we put another line on the ground. So, it was, so you can, you, we graphically, graphically marked the kind of grown, the growing aspect of it. It was all, always stemming also from this idea of a cadavre exqui, which is, you know, this su surrealist game where you kind of open something up and then uh, you draw and then you fold it and you give it to someone else. And then it's, it's also, again, a response, a reference to a response that can continue into you created a full picture. And here in this case, it was hospitality. We started with hospitality. We have uh, a few dancers, some of them are architects, but also dancers. So again, this kind of extremely transversary aspect. Uh, and we had only beers and we had coasters designed by Jean Gilbert. It's an architect from, artist and architect from Brussels. And that's how we opened the whole uh, exhibition. And within, we invited planned, but also partly unplanned because a lot of people approached us during that time. Because the same like you make an exhibition, you make the catalog for the exhibition opening. But isn't that the amazing part is when you actually open the exhibition for the period of three months, you get connected to so many practitioners and even civilians and people who have specific ideas about your theme and how you're going to put that back in. So I sometimes wonder we have to question the formats that we've established, the time frames we open, um, the narrative of how we invite or exclude people, uh, but also why not have the catalog at the end, which we're doing or we started to work on and it will come out in September, which is so nice because almost a year later, you can recreate the, recreate the momentum by a catalog and still kind of collect a, a certain references. So as you see, the exhibition was never closed, never closed, was always active, we always had either the guys who, who uh, are the regie, I love the term in Brussels, like in French speaking, they call it regie. It's usually um, the group of people that take care of ex exhibition build up. But regie sounds so beautiful, again, film and theater. Um, so the space was always active. That's also actually really my favorite shot. I mean, that's like the ca ca beautiful culture class between the outside and the inside. And also, um, yeah, color-wise also, I don't know, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of it. But as you can see, this is pre pretty close to the exhibition finish in brackets, where you have this very dense kind of grid, because the whole thing stems from uh, Jan de Wilder and Inke Fink's uh, book that uh, is also a system, which basically they as an architect started to work and play uh, in Excel a while ago. And this kind of methodology became almost like a creative stance and this kind of creative idea, we then translated onto the, onto the space. So you had different type of uh, exhibits that, you know, we started with this half empty, sp pretty uh, empty space and at the end it was like that. So it's not that we just randomly put things and we do, did have to work with, with an uh, internal architect to always make the setup and still we questioned the exhibits, but sometimes we took exhibits out and then through the conversations, through the exhibition, we found new ideas. And because it was a cadavre exqui, I asked Parasite 2.0, which is a Milanese-based architecture group who doesn't necessarily make buildings, but they produce exhibits that talk about architecture. So here you have a project that is called The Net, The Bone, and The, the Net, The Bone, kind of thing about it, but uh, it's perfect because it's a cadavre, you know, so when you have this mechanism, you want to create visual references to, to the exhibition itself. I also run a, a, a workshop with the Critical Inquiry Lab because I strongly work also with performance. Uh, so since two years, I'm running the same course, a similar course, where, the, where for three days the students don't open a laptop. Uh, they only use their body and maybe existing objects, everyday objects, in order to be activated in space. In this case, it was nice because it was the topic of audience. And we asked ourselves, what can you not do in a museum? And they performed it. And they stayed for three days, sleeping, eating, cooking, uh, praying. Um, because think about it, most institutions don't even have space for different religions to pray. You know, so, so we really question these kind of paradigms of, of, an, of an institution. So yeah, uh, so as a final thing, I think I want to just, because I always find it's nice when you do a, a lecture and you, pub you, you speak in public 
And it's not we meet here right now in this space, in, its, in the digital space, but also in this physical space. But it's also, I think, really important about the things that are still happening. So if you want, I will have a conversation with Alice Rawston on Thursday about a new attitude of design in the context of an exhibition that has a prob very prob problematic title for me, which is Here We Are, Women in Design. And I find this really shocking because, I mean, it could have been at least almost famous <laughs> or the bigger picture, but no, it plays with all the cliches of patriarchy that, that, that the patriarchy has basically established. And on the other hand, also again, thanks to Lukas Feiras, I will be hosting uh, a conversation at Berlinische Galerie uh, on the title of Run the World, which again, I, I, I thought of a different um, format where we will not speak next to each other doing a quick uh, talk about what the people do, but we will have a round table with a table camera and we're going to talk about how we want to run the world in speculation, in a conversation, rather than having a separate conversation. So that's going to happen on the 20, uh, 25th of November together with Angelika Hinter Hinterbrand, Hannah Cook, Alexander Ares and Anna Yeboa. And as Lucas mentioned already, I'm at the moment developing um, a space that is called Civic that will speak about civic infrastructures, civic skills, civic uh, responsibility uh, for the Academy of Art and Design in Basel together with the studio Offshore, which is a graphic design studio, which is really interesting because Claudia Perrin, who used to run uh, uh, the Bauhaus Foundation in Dessau, she really thought that it, an, an institution needs an outlet, but not an outlet that just pops up for six months and then disappears, but maybe a space that really brings links the activities within the institution with the activities that you have as a civilian. So that's what we are working at the moment. And I'm working on a crazy uh, exhibition about solar technology. Until six months ago, six weeks ago, I have not had no idea about what solar design is really and what te this technology means and what kind of lobby is behind it. But what I like really about exhibition making in this kind of cultural context is, is that you be, you're you are completely have no knowledge of it, but no, knowing nothing means that you can kind of create a new reality for people today. So I want to really, again, focus not so much on the history of it, but look at it from the perspective of today and the possible futures and the implications, what it means to design and live under, with and for the sun. So I hope if anyone has some sort of knowledge, please approach me because I'm still looking for people who have ideas about it. And then I will just on time say thank you very much <laughs> for your all attention. Thank you, Sihir. Thank you so much, um, Matilda, um, for this inspiring presentation. And thank you also for constantly yeah, challenging the parameters of curation over the years. As a fellow curator, it's very, very inspirational for me to, to see the, um, it's very concept driven, it's very conceptual, but it's also very visual, it's also a lot of fun, there's irony uh, in it, and irony is such an important one, by the way, <laughs> for your career, yeah. keep the irony. I always um, think of it as a provocation, I do like, there's always a subtle provocation for yeah. me, more than irony, actually. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I would like to actually start my questions on a personal note. Um, and I was one, so I'm, I'm a big believer in like situated knowledges that kind of situate, like knowledges grow in certain contexts. Don't uh, away. Thank you. <laughs> and um, they, so they don't come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. in, in your case, you grew up first in Poland and in Germany. Like what, what's the backdrop? What do you think um, is the history of you or you are like almost like restless questionings of status quo, no, or of, of ways how to do things. Usually, if I would ask you for a task, you will definitely come up with an answer to question my question from the <laughs> beginning. So, is there uh, is this totally off, or is there is there a backdrop to it? How do you explain it yourself? That's it's almost like a question that a psychologist would ask, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I've, um, I sometimes ask myself why I became a curator and why I actually think sometimes not of myself as a curator, but more of a host. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the way I grew up, you know, like when we emigrated from, from Poland to Germany, we were like living like in a Plattenbau and I was super like independent. My parents never had to watch me because 
living in a plattenbau, and I don't know if some of you maybe lived in a plattenbau. As a child, it's a most, it's a dream, you know. Like you don't need a babysitter. You're completely like uh, in, a, in a super beautiful, beautiful dynamic spectrum where your parents know that you're somewhere in the building, and you knock at someone's door, and then you play with someone, you know. And sooner or later, you just know how you go back to the fourth floor. And I loved it, and I loved how my parents would always invite everyone from, from the building and, and beyond, you know, and there were a lot of parties. I never had really to go to bed at 8 p.m. or something. I could if I wanted, but my parents always thought that um, you, kids have to adapt to your, the grown-up lifestyle. And I think this kind of uh, possibility of having very little boundaries, and I was still always al allowed to question a lot of things, allowed me to, to, to become the kind of person who thought, okay, if I'm polite enough, if I ask kindly, if I, I will be met with kindness and maybe the opportunity also to question certain things, discuss certain things. And I mean, I always run in front of closed doors, of course, when you do this. But it's always a possibility to kind of, I don't know, to expand instead of reproduce. But it's what I also think about, I don't know, architectural education. It's cookie cutting, like thinking, oh, it has worked 20 years ago. We can, why can't it be still toxic? You know, like, so I think it's it's time, and I actually really believe that the fact that we have social media at hand, that there's a certain things that can be questioned or addressed or reconfigured, but we also need the spaces where this takes place. And I do really think that when I see how much experiment is in the Netherlands, for example, how, for example. A lot of things are happening in a, fra a small fra framework in, in, in the Switzerland. Uh, I still like it strongly in Germany. I mean, I have literally almost no clients in Germany, and I just ask myself, why? But, may, but then I look at programming, and I look uh, even at education, and I mean, you're also great. You're great because you're also expanding a lot of things for, for, for all kinds of disciplines. But I think it needs more cultural work. Like, Mm. Yeah. And maybe from this last statement, I've, I pick up on two mm, questions, sure. uh, one regarding collaboration, the other mm -hmm. one regarding digitization. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe let's start with collaboration. Um, as we've seen in all your projects, and that's also something that I've been trying kind of to promote here in this uh, um, lecture series, that like nothing is done by yourself. You know? Everything happens uh, so somehow in a, in a teamwork. But um, you work with very different people together at the table. I also believe that none of the challenges that we're facing can be done by a single profession. No. No? Mm. But is there something like, what have you learned or is there a certain trick um, with regards to working with people of very diverse professional, cultural, whatever, um, backgrounds and, and fields of knowledge? I think um, there is no same architect, there's also not the same designer. I mean, the, everyone has a unique experience as first human being, then civilian, and then it, the, the practice comes in hand. And that's exactly what I also want to tackle in, in civic, uh, because I sometimes feel that there's this kind of, the moment when you say that you're an architect, you, you almost feel like it's a gesture of excluding yourself from everyone else, for example which shouldn't be really the case. And maybe it's about training human beings first and then practitioners in a way. Mm -hmm. I actually wrote an article about that together with Olaf Gravelt, um, where we really talked about the importance, how it, what it would be if we would always have a Doppelspitze, which basically means that every position in the world would always be given to two people. Meaning that what would, you know, but we also create this idea of how would life look like. And we always said maybe people really start to work four days a week. And then this one middle mm -hmm. day on the Wednesday would be the day where you go back to civil, like, it's, it's like you, you giving your civil skills to the city, for example. Meaning that you clean up an area or uh, you do, you, you train children or you spend time with elderly people, but you still paid, you know, because mm -hmm. technically that's possible because I actually happened to meet someone once who is a um, man that owns a pharma company in Switzerland and I love taking the train because you sit in this board restaurant and you'd have a funniest conversation with people if you actually really want. And this guy had this brooch, like, you know, like an insect. I was like looking, and I was like, what is going on here? Who is this guy? And then he started talking. And it turns out that he took over the company of his father, and he always thought that, uh, that um, um, being a farmer, like a company that destroys insects, is obviously not 
what he wants to do for his life, but in order to feel a little bit less guilty about it, he continued to pay his employees five times a week, but he gave them one, a choose of activity once per week, so they would give back to, mm. to, uh, yeah, mm. to common life, basically. And I do believe that something like that would be probably, like, as, as much as we can also start talking about the universal basic income, but we don't have time for it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then with regards to digitization, um, you, I think you even described yourself as uh, planning, writing, designing in between physical and digital, mm. digital space. And you also gave us a few examples, but um, as a very generic question, like what opportunist opportunities do you see in the uh, digitization of, or the ubiquitous digitization of our working mm. um, life mm. or also personal mm. life? Like where does it take us to? Mm. I have to answer two things here. I never say who I am because I prefer to say what I do. Mm -hmm. And that's why sometimes I rather say I, draw, I write and I talk and I present and I exhibit mm -hmm. or something because then people know what you can do. Because what I like by the new institute when they ask me to do the solar uh, show, in this meeting they really ask me how do you work? I love that. That never happened to me, for example, in German-speaking uh, countries. Because they were like, do you use Google Docs? Should we do WebEx? Should be like, uh, how do you gonna deliver the file? Do you get an architect to draw this? You know, so it's just like almost checking a lot of boxes before you actually sign up for this. And I really thought that was uh, brilliant. But back to your actual question is, I don't think that we can. We are now in a stage where we cannot not think about digital and physical formats. But we, but I think the danger is mirroring it. You know thinking that the experience of walk, look, looking at the wall and the artwork here is, could be as exciting in a digital space, I find that wrong. But how can you create different kind of atmospheres or experiences where a narrative and an attention or a theme or a title or language kind of, kind of arrives with you? But it's also for me like training people to use certain kind of uh, um, devices and I think when a museum for example comes up with this new technology and new ideas and it just says it's there you don't you, it, doesn't, it doesn't work what it always needs is a human being in my opinion that says you and this is how it works you know and that's why in the museum and in an institution you have cultural mediators who actually are physically there it's a little bit like you're training your body a, a ballerina she doesn't become a ballerina by now she needs to train herself physically to have a certain kind of reaction or like a physical response or has the kind of material as an embodiment of, 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 of physical behavior and that's still needed and intergener intergenerational discourse mm -hmm. very strongly. Actually then um, picking up on the question of how do you work mm -hmm. I, I would like to ask this and this reminded me of uh, we start, started a project that never happened, an unsolicited project. It's still, it's still out <laughs> to become. It was called Methods of Operation, and we wanted to invite different practitioners to talk about the way how they work, mm -hmm. what's their method of working, whether you are um, a, a doctor or whether you're a curator or an architect or you're a lawyer, how do you build a case, or a dancer, how do you come up with a choreography, but really not via content, but how do you, like the methodology mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. um, but then in a nutshell, how do you work? <laughs> Um, how do I work? Um, yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, responsive. I mean, I, I was saying my methodology is strategic improvisation. For me, I like it as a methodology. I mm. think you have to have some sort of strategy, but I love improvisation. Actually, when I teach, I do a lot of uh, 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 improvisation theater techniques with my students, mm. which is really interesting when you like you 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 know this classic brainstorming when you sit at a table, everyone one screams this one, and then the other one screams this, and you point it on. But when you do theater improvisation techniques, you respond physically, you know, and they never sit also, and you get the most exciting outcomes out of it. So I do think that. It's important to have some sort of framework, but I like to respond the whole time, you know, like navigate in between until you arrive, because especially in design and architecture, where, we're, where the path is constantly so linear or thought so linear, where you already, pre you are, it's almost like science fiction, you know, the, I mean, there's another really great science fiction quote, which I unfortunately cannot think of who it was, but it said, when you design, it's something like when you design a car, you also have to design the car crash. So it's almost like you have to um, kind of anticipate what the, con what the, what the 
outcome could be, you know, like what the consequence of your behavior could be. But you still don't know of a car crash because maybe the car it hasn't been designed, but you still have to negotiate all the kind of frameworks just, it's sort of like, yeah, like a dance almost. Mm. Yeah. So there could be JG Ballet, but I have no yeah, idea. But, um, and you give me the perfect cues for my questions. Um, pedagogues, you just said that you use improvisational theater techniques mm. for the students. Um, you've been teaching in many different schools. Mm -hmm. You've been in Chicago before you came to Berlin. Before that, you think you were in Kiel at the Mothesius Hochschule. Mm -hmm. Then you're teaching in Bern at the Angewandt in different different places. So, yeah, like apart from the improvisational theatre, what's your pedagogical approach? This is particular now to the students listening to us here. Like, what is it that you, as a teacher, quote unquote, want to bring across or awaken in, in the students? Maybe, maybe it, I mean, you know, like for me, it was very overwhelming to get this guest professorship at the industrial design department because I realized that in the beginning I thought I have to, because I've never trained, I was trained in the, in, the, in the art school in the Netherlands. It was very wild, you know, like, I mean, you could get away with a lot of things. And then uh, suddenly arriving at a German school in the north of Germany, I, I realized that in the beginning I tried to kind of reproduce this kind of hierarchy thing, like, okay, I'm, t I'm all full of knowledge, I'm telling you exactly what it is, and I start drawing things and collect kind of things for the reader. And I think my most successful uh, uh, seminar was Multiversum. Multiversum, because I lived in Berlin and I would go by train at 5 a.m. in the morning, to Kiel, you know where Kiel is, you don't know what it is. Now I think Kiel is lovely, but back then I really didn't want to live in Kiel. Uh, and I would arrive and I had my first seminar at 10, my second at 2.30 or 4, I don't know, and I was only teaching the whole day. I was exhausted by the end of the day. So I came up with a seminar that was called Multiversum, which on the first day I let them sit with me and I said, talk to me and I write notes. And they talked to me about, like, I asked questions for two hours. And I made so many post-its, and then we made a system and kind of classified this post-its in, I think, 10 weeks and, made, and developed themes. Mm -hmm. And for 10 weeks, we met every Monday evening at 6.37 in my office, and we just talked. And, but everyone had to bring one object or book or text or something that, that the topic refers to. And we had one person that would write um, a protocol mm -hmm. because you cannot just talk and say it or whatever, mm -hmm. but because you have to kind of have this. Uh, and what was interesting for me that this conversation was important, you know, like not like developing and producing instantly, but this kind of concentrated moments where you really have a debate and exchange. And I've also gained so much knowledge that I still use from like book references and, and ideas and to understand how obvious people that come from different spheres of life because depending where you teach, it can be extremely international and beautifully international. And you assume certain things for yourself. At, I mean, at the Design Academy, when one girl at some point said she was Colombian, she said she feels the safest, the most safest in her whole life. And you suddenly realize, of course, she lives in Colombia, where it's, you're threatened by the fact that you as a woman step on the on outside, you know? So it's, it's this conversation, I think. And now, since two, two and a half years, I really have this Let's keep the laptops away. You have a lot of assignments for laptop work, but I want them to become very aware of themselves, which is a lot of dance, choreography, performance. That's actually not so much dance, more choreography and performance. I train them to speak loud. I try to claim space. So it's more like, I think that's really, and I mean, recently I mainly work with master students, but I like, it doesn't matter. And it could be actually any discipline. It would be actually nice to work with, I don't know, biochemists or something like that. Mm. Yeah. And maybe now looking at the clock, my last question, by the way, you get your, your thoughts ready to also ask mm -hmm. and for you guys uh, watching online, also get ready with your questions. But my last generic question is, um, what advice could you give all these becoming <laughs> artists, what architects, advice? designers, curators, human thinkers, beings. performers, <laughs> uh, human beings, people, um, for their kind of... Uh, career, future path? I don't know. I think uh, being humble, hmm. I think it's so important. Like, I don't know, like sometimes, yeah, it's a, it was like this final, final grand st statement. I think, uh, listen to a lot of Prince. It has really made me the person where I am. Listen to a lot of? Prince. Prince, oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's like brilliant. I actually really, I don't know. 
I also figured out that movies from the 90s are really an inspiration as well, also in terms of sonography, you know, like, I mean, God, and Diane Keaton is amazing. But anyway, um, mm. no, I think um, I thought that for me running this blog back then was an eye opener because I think you can learn so much in school if you want, but I actually there's so much out there that you have to look at, you know, so it's you know, like, don't play the, bl gl I don't know, the, the um, blame game of telling that school hasn't delivered or hasn't provided. I think it's a perfect framework when you're a student, you have time, you know, I mean, of course, that's partly also not right, because if you study and you still have to make money to pay for the studies and, you know, you make a living. That's also uh, a very uh, huge burden, and we know that education cannot be taken for granted, especially after teaching at the School of Art Institute, understanding that it costs 60,000 grand per year for a student to study, which means it's just privilege, you know, the privilege get, get, get to get, get educated. But here, and especially in Europe and here in Germany, I think it's a given, and I think it should be not taken for granted, but you also have to make the best out of it for yourself. It's a great closing statement, um, and this is something that I would like to promote here as well. It's great. I'm trying also with this kind of to offer you many different perspectives, maybe challenging, maybe strange, maybe not. But as an activator for you to go out there and start doing your own thing. There's one, you know, half of the stuff you will get here in the university, yeah. and the stuff you just you just start by yourself. It's I almost also, maybe I could even add to it. The thing is that because it was a name, it's funny, but you know, like you like this quick side story. Yeah. Uh, in the summer, I was asked by my former art school to come as a curator at large. I also didn't know what that means, curator at large, to be a, to be of a school. But the new director wanted someone to reframe or rethink what the school means. That's and the Jan van Eyck Academy. No, that's the Academy of Fine Arts. Academy of Fine Arts. So what I did is I looked at, I walked through this, you know, like my alma mater and looked at everything. And I walked towards this Wiel Aritz building, you know, which is a Dutch uh, architect. And I looked at myself and looked at this building and I was thinking, hmm, what you have to think every time when you go to school is, it's a beginning, you know? So what I pitched to him, <laughs> to him during the presentation, but again, strategic improvisation. Yeah. I had my presentation, but now while I was talking, I suddenly thought about this urban myth that in, in the 60s, 70s in Warsaw, someone watched Jacques Tati's Playtime and decided that every building in Warsaw has to have a neon, which I, I cannot confirm if it's real, but it's an urban myth, as I said. So uh, I was just suddenly so popped into my head, I can design a neon. So I pitched it to him during the conversation and they actually allowed me to design it. I can actually show it to you, but now everyone is online. But um, it's on my website, uh, on the title of the beginning. So I designed this massive, gigantic, uh, neon, but the reason why I'm saying that is I just realized that when you're an architect and a designer, and especially when you're self-employed, uh, you wake up every morning and you think it's a beginning. And that's, I think, you have to think about that when you're going to art school, but also when you practice every day, that it's each time it's a beginning. Perfect. Thank you so much. Let's give it another warm applause for Matilda.